Amen. All right, well, we're there in Numbers chapter number 13. And tonight I'm preaching on the subject of shutdown as the judgment of God. And uh, I want to preach on this subject because uh, right now we're dealing with something that's, that's very unique, something that none of us have dealt with in, in our lifetimes. It's happened in the past, but not anybody who's alive today has really dealt with a shutdown like we're dealing with right now. And right now we're dealing with a societal shutdown. Uh, where uh, we're being told by the government that we have to basically be quarantined or locked down, whatever you want to call it, stay at home or safe at home. And uh, a lot of workplaces are shut down and a lot of uh, uh, people are just not, not working, not doing anything, just staying home and going out for certain essential things. And I wanted to preach about this because throughout the Bible, you actually find God shutting things down as a judgment uh, throughout Scripture. And what I want to do tonight, I, I, I want to give you three examples, and, and we, there's probably more examples that we could look at, but for sake of time, I want to give you three examples where God just shut things down. And what we mean by that is where He just did not allow life to continue as it could have or maybe as it should have, where people had plans and ideas, and He just put a stop to it and made them wait and made them do something different. I want to go through and begin by just giving you three examples from Scripture for these shutdowns as the judgment of God. And then I want to go back to all three of those examples and give you an application, something we could learn from those stories, something we could apply during our own shutdown that we are experiencing today. So the first one is there in Numbers chapter 13. And of course, if you're familiar with the story, you know that Moses had led the children of Israel out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness, and they're actually getting ready to go into the promised land. At this point, they've only been in the wilderness for a couple of months doing certain things that God asked them to do. And they're going in to the promised land, and they decide to send in 12 spies. 12 spies, one from each of the tribes of Israel, and they send them in to spy out the land. You're there in Numbers 13. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says this, And Moses sent them, sent the twelve spies, to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain. Now something you need to understand is that this mission, these spies going into the land, this was to be a reconnaissance mission. This was not meant for them to go in to decide whether or not they would be going into the land, that decision had already been made. God had already given the commandment that they were to go in to possess the land. The purpose for sending in the 12 spies was just to get the lay of the land, just to figure out where the cities were, where the walls were, where the resources were. It was a re reconnaissance mission just to get information that they could use. It was not in order for them to decide whether they were going to go into the land. It was in order for them to make decisions of how they were going to go into the land. And they sent these 12 spies in, and we won't take the time to read all the verses. We, of course, read the entire chapter already. But they go in for 40 days. For 40 days, these 12 spies go into the land. They spy out the land. They get a view of the land. And when they come back, they do something that they were never asked to do. They came back and they gave a report. And the vast majority of the 12 spies, in fact, 10 of the spies, gave an evil report. Notice verse number 21. The Bible says, So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as the men came to Hamath. Look down at verse 25, and we're just skipping a few of these verses for sake of time. Notice verse 25, and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. So I want you to notice that they're searching the land for 40 days. Look down at verse number 32, same chapter, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land... Uh, through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people we saw in it are men of great stature. And they go on to talk about how they saw the Anakims and they saw giants there and how they don't believe that they can uh, take the land. And of course, if you read the story and we read the chapter, you see that Caleb gets up and says, we can do this. God has given us the land. We need to trust in the Lord. You see that Joshua was one of the spies as well. And he says, yes, we can do it. Two of the spies went and gave a good report and said, we should follow God. But 10 of the spies gave an evil report and they discouraged the people. Look at Numbers chapter 14. You're there in chapter 13. Just flip over to chapter 14 and look at verse number 1. Numbers 14 and verse 1. 
And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt. So you see how these 12 spies, these 10 spies gave an evil report and they swayed the people. They discouraged the people and the people get swayed by this. They get influenced and they turn against the leaders. And I'm not preaching about this tonight, but let me just make the point since we're there. It's always interesting to me how you could have a pastor or a spiritual leader or a man of God like Moses who sets the direction and says, here's what we're going to do, here's why we're going to do it, here's the way we're going, and then, you, and then somebody brings up an evil report. You know, here it's in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, by the means of these 12 spies. Today, it'll be by the means of a YouTube video. It'll be by the means of a Facebook comment. It'll be by the means of, of, of an email where someone starts spreading, you know, these discouraging things, and then people get swayed. They get scared and they get afraid and now all of a sudden they're turning against the leadership and murmuring against the leadership and this is what happens in the story. Moses sent them in not to figure out whether they were going to go into the land. He sends them in just to figure out how they're going to go into the land. These men come back with an evil report. The people get upset. They turn against Moses. They turn against Aaron. They turn against the leadership. They, they actually start talking about going back to Egypt and submitting themselves as servants and as slaves in Egypt. Egypt and God responds with punishing them. Now notice chapter 14 and look down at verse number 10. Numbers chapter 14 and verse 10. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Talking about uh, Moses and Aaron. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me not? For all the signs which I have showed among them. Look, at, look down at verse number 28. Say unto them. This is God speaking to Moses, telling them, I want you to give this message to the children of Israel. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcass shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of none. And I want you to notice, it's very interesting how God says to them, if you look back at verse 28, say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, notice these words, as ye have spoken, as ye have spoken. It's interesting to me that here you have the children of Israel murmuring and complaining, right? I just preached a sermon about anxiety and how anxiety is a result of us having a situation that we're uncertain about, having a situation where there's a big if as to how things are going to play out and how things are going to actually uh, go and play out in our lives. And then what we do is we take that if and we add to it just the worst possible outcome, just the worst thing that could happen. And a lot of times what you find is that what you think is the worst outcome ends up being the worst outcome. Sometimes we call that uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy. But here we see that God actually listened to the children of Israel, listened to their murmuring, and he said, look, I had this plan for you. You were going to go into the land, you were going to possess the land, but he says, as ye have spoken, he said, he said I'm going to take your fears and your complaints, I'm going to take the things you've complained about, and I'm going to make that happen because you have not trusted me, because you have not trusted what I said. So look, you ought to be very careful about complaining during times of uncertainty. You got to be careful about, oh, well, what about this? And what if they do that? And what if the government, uh, you know, locks us down for five years? Hey, I'd be careful about saying stuff like that. You may find yourself living that because God might hear you complain and not trust in him and say, okay, well, let's just do, let's just go with your plan. I mean, he says to them, he says, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do unto you. 
He says, all the things you said that you're afraid were going to happen, God says, I'm going to make sure they happen. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to the whole number from 20 years old and upward, which in the Bible, that's when you're an adult, 20 years old and upward. He says, every adult which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land, concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein. He said, save, he said, except for two guys, Caleb and Joshua, because there was two spies that gave a good report, Caleb and Joshua. And here's what's interesting. Out of the children of Israel, when they go into the promised land, the only two men that went into the promised land that lived in that generation were Caleb and Joshua. Everyone else were uh, children and all their parents died in uh, the, the wilderness. Notice verse 31. God says, but your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in. It's interesting. He said, you used your children as an excuse why you're afraid to do what I've asked you to do. He said, well, you know what? I'm going to use them instead. Them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. Notice verse 32. But as for you, your carcass, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness. Notice, 40 years. God said, look, you, we, we often hear about the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Why did that happen? Why did that come about? It came about because 12 spies went in to spy out the land for 40 days. They came back with an evil report. They swayed the people, discouraged the people. And God says, okay, you know what? I'm going to shut you guys down. I'm going to put you in a period of waiting. I'm going to make you wander and walk in circles around the wilderness. In fact, I'm going to make you do it one year for every day that the spies were in that land. You went in for 40 days and decided that you didn't want to trust me, that you didn't want to obey me, that you did not want to uh, allow me to fulfill my will in your life, then I'll make you wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Notice what he says in verse 33. And bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. You're there in Numbers 14. Go to Numbers 32. Numbers uh, 32. Look at verse number 13. Numbers 32 and verse 13. See, when they came out of Egypt, they thought, oh, we're just going to be in the wilderness for a few weeks. We're going to be in the wilderness for a couple of months. Then we're going to go into the promised land. And in the promised land, we're going to have land. We're going to, have, uh, we're going to build houses. We're going to have cities with walls. We're going to have farms. We're going to have, be able to put some roots down. But God decided to judge them. He said, you know what? For 40 years, actually, I'm going to shut you down. For 40 years, you're going to be in a period of waiting. For 40 years, you're not going to get any land. You're not going to build any houses. You're, not, you're going to live in a tent because you're going to be a wanderer in the wilderness for 40 years, one year for every day that the spies were in the land. Notice Numbers 32 and verse 13. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness Forty years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. So we're talking about shutdowns as the judgment of God. And the first shutdown that I wanted to just highlight for you is this famous story of the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. Why did they get shut down? Why did they wander in the wilderness? It was actually a judgment of God because they complained and murmured and lacked their, the faith needed to do what God asked them to do. God said, okay, then you can just walk in circles for 40 years. I'll just put you in a period of limbo. I'll put you in a period of waiting. I mean, isn't that kind of what we're in right now? With this coronavirus, it's hard to kind of make decisions. It's hard. People are asking me about the Red Hot Preaching Conference. Is it, is it still on? Is it off? You know, here's the thing. We're kind of in limbo. We don't really know what's going to happen. We don't, it's, it's hard to tell you right now what's going to happen in July. I mean, hopefully by July, things are back to normal. But at this point, who really knows? We're just kind of wandering in this wilderness, kind of walking in circles. And look, God has a judgment for the children of Israel where he shut them down for 40 years. He shut down the entire nation for 40 years as a judgment. Let me give you another example of a shutdown. The first one is of the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. The second one involves the children of Israel as well towards the end of their history. Go to the book of Leviticus, if you would. Leviticus chapter 25. You're there in the book of Numbers. So if you go just backwards, you're going to go uh, into the book of Leviticus, from Numbers into Leviticus. Leviticus 25. In order to understand this next shutdown, you have to uh, understand some of the things that God had commanded the children of Israel. 
In Leviticus 25 and verse 7, the Bible says this. And in the seventh year, I want you to notice year there. In the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the Lord. A Sabbath for the Lord, thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thine vineyard. And if you remember, uh, God had commanded the, the law of the Sabbath day, the seventh day of a week, people were supposed to cease from their work and they were supposed to rest. That was a day to rest and that was a day to acknowledge God and all those things. That was during the week. But God had also given a Sabbath of years. God had commanded the nation of Israel that they were to have business, they were to have commerce, they were to go about their lives for six years, but on the seventh year, they were actually to rest. They were to do no business. They were to allow the land to rest, and God commanded the nation of Israel, they were supposed to allow the land to rest one year every seven years. I mean, think about that. People are all up in arms right now about, oh, everything's shut down. It's been two weeks. Imagine if you lived in the nation of Israel where God commanded you to shut everything down for an entire year, once a year, once every seven years. That's what he commanded. That's what he told them to do. And God warned them. God warned them that if they refused to do it, that he would punish them because God knows how mankind is. And, of course, people, they don't want to stop working for an entire year because think about all the money you're going to miss out on. I mean, think about the crops that you could grow and sell an entire year. So notice what he says in Leviticus 26 and verse 33. Now, this hadn't happened yet, but God is already, already telling them what he's going to do if they don't listen. Leviticus 26, look at verse 33. And I will scatter you, God says. I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. He said, I'm going to take you out of the land, I'm going to scatter you so that the land is desolate. The root word there is deserted. The land is, has no inhabitants in it. No one is walking around in it. Look at verse 34. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when ye dwelt upon it. God said, look, I want you to let the land rest one year every seven years, and if you don't do it, then I'm just going to go ahead and have an enemy come in and capture you and take you out of the land, and then the land's going to rest, and the land is going to enjoy her Sabbaths if you don't allow it to rest. And of course, they chose not to allow the land to rest. So what did God do? Go to 2 Chronicles 36. 2 Chronicles 36. If you're there in Leviticus, you have Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 36. Now in Leviticus, we just have God saying, here's what I want you to do. And God is saying, and here's what I will do if you don't listen, right? We've been learning a lot about the uh, covenants, and that's how the covenant, the Mosaic covenant worked. It's an if then. If you do this, then I will do that. And what he said is, if you don't allow the land to rest, then I will take you out of the land, and I will force you to allow the land to rest. They didn't listen. They chose not to listen. So what does God do? Well, it shouldn't be a surprise to any of us. God keeps his word. Second Chronicles 36, look at verse 17. This is now towards the end of the history of the nation of Israel. The Bible says, therefore, he brought upon them the king of the Chaldeans. That's the king of Babylon. That's Nebuchadnezzar. He says, God brought Nebuchadnezzar. What did he do? Who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young men or maiden, old or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. Look down at verse 20. And them that had escaped from the sword, so he said he killed a bunch of them. And then those that he did not kill, notice, carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. So, of course, this is the stories of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Esther, 
The stories of later on when Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel, after the captivity, they come. Here we have these stories where God allowed the nation to be taken captive and they were put into exile for 70 years. The reason we have books like the book of Esther, the book of Daniel, uh, the books of Nehemiah, Ezra, the reason we have those stories about Ezekiel, remember Ezekiel was in, in the captivity. The reason we have that is because God allowed them to be carried into captivity for 70 years. For 70 years, he shut them down. But why did God do it? Notice 2 Chronicles 36, verse 21. In verse 20, he says, He carried he away to Babylon, and they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Verse 21, To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept her Sabbaths to fulfill three score and ten years. See, God said, for, he, he said, there were 70 Sabbaths that you missed. There were 70 Sabbaths that you should have allowed the land to rest, and you chose not to. So God says, that's fine, no problem. You want to do what you want to do? No problem, but I'm going to shut you down. And he literally took them out of the land for 70 years so they could get caught up on all the Sabbaths that they missed, and God shut them down. No more commerce, no more temple worship, no more uh, uh, farming, no more land growing. Now, after the captivity, the children of Israel come back, and they get back to work. But for 70 years, God shut them down. God did not allow them to continue. So here we see a second example of a shutdown as the judgment of God. Let me give you a third example. Go to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter number 4, if you find the major prophets, you've got towards the end of the Old Testament, you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. So I gave you two examples of the nation of Israel being shut down. And one was at the beginning of their history, one was at the end. You have the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness that was a shutdown from God, where God shut them down. He said, you're not going to continue. I'm going to put you on hold. I'm going to put you in limbo. I'm going to put you on wait because of my judgment. Then we had, at the end of their history, the 70-year captivity. That was a shutdown where God said, I'm going to shut you down. I'm going to put you on hold. You're not going to move forward. You're going to be on timeout. And we're looking at these judgments, these shutdowns from the judgments of God. Now, those were two uh, shutdowns for the nation of Israel. This third one, I want to show you just a personal shutdown. Because right now, we're experiencing a national shutdown. And you could even call it a global shutdown because this coronavirus is affecting the entire globe. But this could just happen in your personal life. It doesn't have to be everybody. God could just choose to shut you down personally. Let me give you an example of that. Daniel chapter 4, look at verse 30. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 30 the Bible says this, the king spake. Now, this is King Nebuchadnezzar. And notice what the King Nebuchadnezzar says, because he's very uh, pride-filled. The Bible says, the king spake and said, is not this great Babylon? Notice what he says, that I have built. Can you, I mean, you can just feel the pride coming out of his words. Is not this great Babylon that I have built? For the house of the kingdom, by the might of my power, and for the honor of my majesty. So he's just talking himself up, King Nebuchadnezzar. He's saying, look at all this. Look at everything I've accomplished. Look at what I have built by the might of my power, by the might of my majesty. Look what I've done. I love the wording in verse 31. While the word was in the king's mouth. I mean, before, before he even got done saying in the midst of his sentence, he's interrupted. Notice, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. He says, I'm going to shut you down. The kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and I want you to notice, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar here is he literally went crazy. God made him go insane. In fact, you can study this on your own time. There actually is an insanity out there. There's a diagnosed insanity that makes you think you're, uh, you're cattle, where people go out and they eat grass. I mean, it, it happens today. This is what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, where God made him go crazy, and he said the kingdom is departed. 
Verse 32, he said, They shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts. He said, You're going to go out and live with the animals of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. He says, And seven times. Now that phrase seven times, I believe he's talking about seven years. Because in the book of Daniel, when you see the word times, it's seven years. When it comes to prophecy, he talks about times, time, and times and half a time, and he's talking about three and a half years. So here he says, seven times shall pass over thee. God said, I'm going to shut you down for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to put you out in the field like an animal for seven years. Uh, He says, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Verse 33, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. And by the way, that's why I think this was seven years and not seven days or seven months, because it says that his hair were grown like eagle's feathers. I mean, his hair grew to where it looked like long strands like the feathers of an eagle, and his nails like bird's claws. I mean, get this vision. Here you have Nebuchadnezzar, the the leader of the world, right? The equivalent of President Trump today, that was Nebuchadnezzar. The leader of the world, and he goes crazy for seven years where he's out in the field eating grass like an ox, having his hair grow out. It looks like the eagles of a feathers, uh, the, the, the feathers of an eagle. His, his uh, uh, nails grow out. It looks like bird's claws. He went crazy for seven years, and God just shut him down. Because he's talking about how great he is, how wonderful he is. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've built. Look at how productive I am. Look at all the success that I have. And God says, okay, how about we shut you down for seven years? How about we put you in a, wait, uh, in a state of waiting? How about we put you in the wilderness for seven years and we shut you down? And here's what I'm telling you, because today people are, are all up in arms. Look, there's no new thing under the sun. God has putting, been putting civilizations and people in shutdowns and judgments since the beginning. He shut down the nation of Israel for 40 years. He shut down the nation of Israel for 70 years in captivity. He shut down Nebuchadnezzar for 70 years. And there's other examples we could look at. But I'm preaching about the judgment of God is shut down. And that was the introduction. That was a long introduction. Uh, The rest of the sermon won't won't be as long. But I want you to see these shutdowns. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to go back and revisit these shutdowns and just give you an application that we could learn in regards to these stories. Why did God shut them down? You're there in Daniel 4, so let's start with Nebuchadnezzar. And let me give you three applications or three statements, three thoughts that we can apply that we can learn from the shutdowns that God did in the Bible and we can apply to our shutdowns today. Here's number one. During a shutdown, we should acknowledge that God is in control. During a shutdown, we should acknowledge that God is in control. Why did God shut Nebuchadnezzar down? Well, remember, he was thinking he was in control. I mean, the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Nebuchadnezzar is just full of himself, thinking that he's in control. Look at what he has accomplished. Look at what he has done. And God says, You know what? I'm going to shut you down for a minute. I'm going to shut you down for a second just to show you that I am in control. Look at verse 34. And at the end of the days, at the end of the seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. And notice, because he went crazy. Now God's going to make him sane again. And mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High God. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. And I want you to notice how Nebuchadnezzar has an attitude change at the end of these seven years. Verse 35, notice what he says. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. At first he was saying, look at me. Look at how wonderful I am. Look at everything I've accomplished. After the shutdown, Nebuchadnezzar says, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Notice what he says. And he doeth according to his will. You understand what what Nebuchadnezzar is saying about God? Here's what he's saying. God does whatever God wants to do. He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth Notice, and none can stay his hand. 
Here's what he means. He says, when God decides to reach out his hand and mess with you, no one can hold back the hand of God. He says, none can stay his hand. He says, no one can stop him. He says, the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. God does whatever he wants. He doeth according to his will, and none can stay at his hand. No one can stop him or say unto him, what doest thou? He says, no one can question him. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar says, God does, what he, God does what he wants. No one can stop him. Nobody can question him. Nobody can say, what doest thou? Notice verse 36. At the same time, my reason returned unto me. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my Lord sought unto me. And I was established in the kingdom. And excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Later on in this chapter, or excuse me, earlier in this chapter, Daniel actually told Nebuchadnezzar, if you don't get your pride in check, this is going to happen. God is going to do this to you. And Daniel told uh, Nebuchadnezzar some of my favorite words in the Bible. He says, the heavens do rule. He says, God is in control, Nebuchadnezzar, and God can shut you down. Go to the book of Acts real quickly, if you would. Acts chapter 17. Towards the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. You say, what can we learn during the shutdown? Here's, here's something you can learn. Acknowledge that God is in control. <laughs> Acknowledge, you know, you know, <coughs> excuse me, the United States was having probably one of the greatest financial revivals. The economy was doing better right before this coronavirus thing than, uh, than it ever done. I mean, think the economy was up. Everything was going. People were feeling pretty good about themselves. I mean, people were feeling, feeling, were feeling pretty good about, you know, what we're accomplishing and businesses are growing and things are, are, are looking up. And God just decides, you know, a, a few weeks ago, none of us had heard of a coronavirus. None of us had heard the term social distancing. None of us had heard of a stay-at-home order or a safe-at-home order. And God decides whenever he wants and no one can stop him that he'll send a plague down and just shut down the economy. Send the plague down and just shut down uh, uh, society. Send the plague down and just put everyone in the wilderness in a waiting period and stop it. You say, what can we learn? Here's what you can learn. God is in control. What you can learn is that the heavens do rule, that God is in control, that God does what he wants, when he wants, and no one can stay back his hand. So, you know, as Christians, don't sit there and complain about the coronavirus and I wish we could go to church and I wish we could do this and I wish, obviously, we all wish we could go to church. But you know what? We ought to stand in awe and say, God can stop the greatest economy in the world, supposedly, the United States of America. God can stop it in one day. In one week, in a few weeks, God can send a plague just to teach us all, just to remind us all, just for us to all acknowledge that it is God who is in control. Acts chapter 17 and verse 24. Acts chapter 17 and verse 24. I love what Paul says on Mars Hill of God. Acts 17 and verse 24. The Bible says this, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with man's hands, don't miss this, as though he needed anything. You know, God doesn't need anything from you and me. Oh, well, you know, I don't think we should go to live stream only services. I, I think we need to continue to, to worship. Hey, look, do you realize that the worship that we do to God is a benefit to us and not him? Do you realize that God, God's not missing out on like, oh, man, they're live stream only. Now I'm missing out on the worship. Hey, the Bible says neither is worship with man's hands as though he needed anything. Look, the benefit of going to church was a benefit that God gave us, not a benefit for himself. He doesn't need anything from you. He doesn't need anything from me. Notice, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. He says if you woke up this morning and you had breath, it's because God gave it to you. If you're breathing right now, it's because God, the Bible says that God holds the breath of your life in his hand. If you're alive, it says he gave it to you. He said he gave his breath, and then he says, and all things. Anything you have, everything you have, God gave it to you. Oh, my job is struggling. Well, God is the one that gave you the job. And God sometimes shuts things down. God sometimes puts us in a wilderness. God sometimes puts us in a place of waiting just to show us, just to show 
that he is in control. And one lesson you can learn during this shutdown is acknowledge that God is in control. Acknowledge that God can stop the greatest economy and God can stop any economy. When he wants, because God does what he wants, when he wants, and no one can stay back his hand. Nebuchadnezzar learned that, and let me tell you something, Donald Trump's learning it today. The Nebuchadnezzar of today, he's learning. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, uh, Donald Trump was probably going into, I, I, he probably couldn't wait till the fall. The presidential election, he was going into that election thinking, good night, they're going to put Joe Biden against me, I'm going to eat him alive. Now, all of a sudden, God just throws this coronavirus in the mix. I'm sure, I'm sure Donald Trump's like, I got to fix this. You know, God can show us that he can destroy everything. He can turn things around. And one of the reasons that God shuts down and a lesson that we can learn from a shutdown is acknowledge that God is in control. Let me give you a second lesson. Go, go back to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 8. If you kept your place in Numbers, I'm not sure if I asked you to keep your place in Numbers, but if you kept your place in Numbers, right after Numbers, you have the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're talking about shutdowns as a judgment of God. We looked at three examples of shutdowns. One was Nebuchadnezzar being shut down for seven years. And then we're learning an application. What are we learning? That we can acknowledge or that we should acknowledge that God is in control. The second uh, shutdown we looked at was the captivity, right? The children of Israel went into captivity for 70 years. They went into captivity for 70 years because they refused to allow the land to rest on the seventh year of, uh, of, of every seven years, that one year, they refused to allow the land to rest. So God shut them down, put them into captivity. Now, what can we learn? Here's what we can learn. And just kind of think this through with me. If God told the nation of Israel that every seven years, I want you to work for six years, and on the seventh year, I want you to shut things down, I want the land to rest, and they chose not to, why would they choose not to do that? I mean, there's one reason, the love of money. I mean, the the Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And the only reason that these people decided to, no, we're going to keep working the seventh year, and the year after that, and the year after that, and the year, and the seventh year after that, why would they do that? Just because if they shut things down for an entire year, they were going to lose money. So they said, you know what, we're just going to keep working. We're going to work the land, we're going to work the field, we're going to make money. They made their decision based on money, and then God shut them down and took them out of the land to allow the land to rest. And here's something we can learn during our shutdown. We can learn this, to not place our trust in money. Not only should we acknowledge that God is in control, but we should learn to not place our trust in money. Deuteronomy chapter 8, look at verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 17 The Bible says this, and thou say in thine heart, and look, this could be the life verse of the average American two months ago, three months ago, and thou say in thine heart, my power and and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth, and God says, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. See, God, see, sometimes God has to remind us that it is God who gives us the power to get wealth. And you know what? We should learn not to place our trust in money. You should learn not to place your trust in the stock market. You should learn not to place your trust in business. There's nothing wrong with being engaged in business and being engaged in commerce. There's nothing wrong. God actually wants us to work hard and be a part of those things. But we need to learn that our trust at the end of the day is in the Lord. And sometimes God shuts things down just to say, oh, you want to keep working the seventh year? Let me just shut this down for 70 years so you can learn to trust me. So you can learn to just do what I've asked you to do. Because the truth is this. Go to Matthew chapter 6 if you would. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. First book in the New Testament. Should be fairly easy to find. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. The truth is this. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God. And I've always thought this was interesting. Because here Jesus says, you cannot serve God. And if you were going to finish that sentence for Jesus, or if I were going to finish that sentence, here's what we would say. You cannot serve God and the devil, right? Wouldn't we all say that? You can't serve God and the devil. When you think of the opposite of God, you think the devil. And you say, oh, well, uh, if, if we can't put the devil, then what would you put? You can't serve God and the world. How about this? You can't serve God and yourself. I mean, if we didn't know what the verse said, and somebody said, Jesus said these words, you cannot serve God and 
fill in the blank. And, and we didn't know what he said, and they're asking us to fill in the blank. We would say the devil, the world, ourselves. You know what Jesus said? He said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You know what the word mammon means? It's an older word that means material wealth or material goods. It's interesting when, God, when Jesus decides to, to talk about the different things that people worship instead of God. He, cho- he could have done the devil. He could have done the world. He could have done ourselves. But he throws in there money. And should that surprise us as American? I mean, the average American is worshiping the, what do they call it? The almighty dollar. Well, you know what we're learning? The dollar is not as almighty as they thought. Because we can learn in these shutdowns. And what we should learn in these shutdowns is to not place our trust in money. And by the way, let me just say this. Because the literal application to that story is this. God told them, shut down for one year every seven years. They refused to do it. And God said, well, you know what? Here's the thing. I'm going to get what I'm going to get. I'm going to get it out of you either way. You're either going to shut down once a year for seven years voluntarily, or I'm going to shut you down. And seven, he said, the land's going to rest either way. The land's going to fulfill her Sabbath, whether you volunteer it or not. And look, I'm just telling you, when God tells you to give him something, when God tells you to do something, it's best for us to just say, you know what, God, you, you're in control. No one can stay back your hand. I'm just going to do what you've asked me to do because you're going to get it out of me either way. Here's all I'm saying. I wonder how much tithe God is getting back right now. From people who, well, I can't tithe. I mean, give God 10% of my fine. I can't do that. I need to keep that for myself. God says, sure, I'll just get out of you anyway. Let's shut things down. You're not going to work. Let's shut things down. You just lost all that money in the stock market. You should have just tithed it to God. You should have just given it to God. God says, I'm going to get it either way. You're not going to stay back my hand. And, And he says, you can learn in the shutdown. Here's what you can learn. Acknowledge that God is in control. You can learn in the shutdowns to not place our trust in money. Let me give you a third one. We'll finish up. We're talking about shutdowns as the judgment of God. Go back to Numbers 14 where we started. Numbers chapter 14. We're looking at these three examples of the shutdowns, right? We saw Nebuchadnezzar get shut down for seven years. An individual gets shut down for seven years. God puts him in a limbo period. He puts him in a waiting period. He says, you can't do anything. You're shut down. What can we learn from that? We learn this, that the heavens do rule. That God does what he wants, when he wants, and no one can stay back his hand, and no one can question him. And we should learn in our shutdown and acknowledge the fact that God is in control. Then we saw the shutdown of the captivity, where God put the children of Israel in captivity for 70 years because they did not allow the land to rest. And God says, the land's going to rest either way. You know what's interesting? My, my wife was telling me, she was reading some articles, where they're talking about during this shutdown that we're in right now, they're talking about how the skies are clearing up, the skies over Manila is blue, the sky, you know, a lot of the places where a lot of commerce happens and a lot of people are, nature, you know, the Bible talks about us taking care of nature. Obviously, we're not supposed to be hippies and worshiping nature, but God wants us to take care of this world and you know part of me wonders if God is shutting down allowing the land to rest I mean he did it before why wouldn't he do it now he's no respecter of persons so we should learn to acknowledge that God is in control we should learn to not rely on finances and the love of money here's number three during a shutdown we should learn to take the opportunities when you have them to take the opportunities when you have you know what's interesting about the children of Israel God said, I want you to go into the promised land. Moses sends 12 spies in to do reconnaissance, to not to figure out whether they're going to go in, but to figure out how they're going to go in. Ten of the spies come back and give an evil report. The children of Israel decide they don't want to go. They want to stone Moses. They want to stone Aaron. They talk about going back to Egypt. They get discouraged. They lack faith in God. God gets mad and says to Moses, tell the children of Israel, Forget you, I'm going to have you wander for 40 years. I'm going to lock you down one year for every day that the spies were in the land. Everything you said that you thought I was going to do because I couldn't protect you, now I'm going to make sure that actually happens. You're going to fall in the wilderness. Your carcasses will fall in the wilderness. And those kids that you said you were protecting, I'll bring them into the land. When, God, when Moses tells the children of Israel this, why don't you notice the response? Numbers 14, verse 39. And Moses told these sayings. Unto all the children of Israel. And the people mourned 
greatly. What Moses told the children of Israel is, you're going to wander for 40 years now. You've lost the opportunity to go into the promised land. Now they're mourning because they've lost the opportunity. Look what they decided to do, verse 40. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and will go up unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. And these, these, they're, like, they're like Goldilocks. You can't make these people happy. God says, go into the land. They said, no. God says, fine, don't go into the land. Now they're like, no, we want to go. And now they're actually going to force themselves to go. They actually get up early in the morning. They say, okay, let's go and take the land. Notice the response from God, verse 41. And Moses said, wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. Moses said, it's done. God already said you're not going to do it. God said your children are going to do it. You can't force it now. You can't go into that land now. Look at verse 42. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites and uh, are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye have turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. Verse 44. But they presumed to go up. Unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. And the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites, which dwelt in that hill, notice, and smote them and discomforted them even unto Hormah. I hope you understand what's happening here. God says, Go into the land. They say, No. God says, Okay, I'm going to shut you down for 40 years. When they heard that, they said, Okay, we'll go. But it's too late now. They lost the opportunity. You know what we can learn from shutdowns? We can learn to take the opportunities when you have them. What, what, what I think is very interesting, I made a video about this uh, just yesterday. What I think is very interesting is that because there is this infectious, highly fatal disease going around, we chose to go to live stream only services on a temporary basis to keep the spread of the disease from happening at least among our church people, because I actually care about our church people. And you know what, what's interesting is that I, I've gotten kind of some, some pushback. But you know what's interesting? I have not gotten any pushback from anyone who was faithful to our church before the coronavirus, at least not to me publicly or to my face. Anyone who came to our church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, anyone who was faithful to soul winning week after week at Verity Baptist Church, ev- everyone that has talked to me, everyone that has talked to me about the situation that has been faithful, Everyone has been nothing but encouraging and saying, Pastor, we're with you. Pastor, we agree with you. Pastor, you lead and we'll follow. You know what's funny, though? People who did not come to church, people who were not faithful to church, people who would come once and then you wouldn't see them for eight weeks, then they'd come again, you wouldn't see them for 12 weeks, then they'd come again, you wouldn't see them for a while, they never went soul winning, they weren't faithful. Those are the ones that are emailing me, you've caved in to the government, you are a FEMA pastor, you need to open up the congregation uh, service again. I'm thinking to myself, why would I open up the congregational services so you could skip it? You had the opportunity to go to church. You had the opportunity to go soul winning. Now when you can't do it, now you're going to complain about it. You know what you are? You're the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness, complaining and murmuring. And the truth is this. You don't have any desire to go soul winning. You don't have any desire to be faithful to church because I'm going to go ahead and call it out right now. As soon as this is over and we get back to church, you don't have the character to show up faithfully. All you want to do is complain and murmur and try to find something to make yourself look like you're more spiritual than the rest of us. You know what? I'm not worried about it. I've been soul winning every week for over 20 years now. I mean, probably close, since I was seven years old, I've been, been soul winning. My wife's been soul winning every week since she was 17 years old. I'm not concerned about it. I've been here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You know what I believe? People say, are you worried about your church family? You know what? The people that are faithful to church, here's what I believe. Those who are faithful Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, soul winning, before the coronavirus, are going to be faithful Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, after the coronavirus. And all these losers who couldn't show up to church, but now all of a sudden they've got some spiritual backbone. They want to try to call us all out. They want to call out great men like Pastor Anderson who's fought the battles, who's been faithful, who's been there. And all of a sudden, some guy we've never even heard of wants to act like he's some spiritual giant. Well, you know what? You've lost the opportunity, buddy. It's too late. You know something you can learn during a shutdown? 
to take the opportunities when you have them. You ought to show up to church when you have the opportunity to do it. You ought to show up to soul winning when you have the opportunity to do it. But you ought to be embarrassed and ashamed of yourself when you didn't have the character and integrity to do it when you could to complain about it now. I mean, is there, no, is there no shame in you? Is there no embarrassment in you? Is there nothing in you that says, wow, I am a hypocrite? No, because all you're trying to do is grandize yourself. Trying to pin yourself against those of us that have actually been there. Look, let me tell you something. In 2016, I had a very hard conversation with the sheriff of the county of Sacramento during our major protest. He's like yelling at me, telling me, you must shut down church. You cannot have church on that day of the protest. It's going to be bad. There's going to be a thousand protests. And I said, we're not shutting down church. You know, this is a different situation where there's actually a health crisis. No, you, and here's the truth. Verity Baptist Church, we shut down before anybody forces to. You know why we shut down? Because we thought it was the right thing to do. And, and, and we can get into those details later, and I'll probably preach a whole sermon about it uh, next week. I'm, 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 I'm going to preach a sermon about my thoughts on this coronavirus and the lockdown. But let me just tell you something. Here's something you can learn during the shutdown is that you ought to take opportunities when you have them. You know, I'm hoping some people that are sitting back now that weren't faithful to church are going to be like, hey, maybe I should show up to church because maybe I won't have that opportunity in the future. Maybe I should show up to soul winning because I won't have that opportunity in the future. Here are the children of Israel. They could have gone into the promised land. They chose not to. God takes it away, and then they're complaining about the fact they can't go in. You know what we should learn during a shutdown? We had to acknowledge that God is in control. We had to acknowledge that the heavens do rule in the affairs of men. We have acknowledged that God can put his hand in your business anytime he wants. And no one can stop him. We ought to learn not to rely on the finances. We ought to learn to save and prepare and do what we can, but at the end of the day, it's in the hands of the Lord. And we ought to learn to take opportunities when you have them. You, you, and, don't, and don't sit there and complain about an opportunity you lost when you never took, op took the opportunity to do it when you could have. You're like the children of Israel whining in the wilderness. You weren't going to go in the promised land anyway. You weren't going to show up to church anyway. You weren't going to go soul winning anyway. So why don't you quit your complaining? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Bible, Lord. Thank you for the fact that there really is no new thing under the sun. And Lord, thank you for teaching us that, look, we're, we're not special. We, we Americans really have ego problems where we think that we're special, that something's happening here that's special. There's no new thing under the sun. You've shut down societies before. You've shut down nations before. You've shut down economies before. You've shut down individuals before. Lord, help us during this shutdown. And we hope that it's not seven years and 40 years or 70 years. We hope it's not, not, not that long. But help us during this shutdown to acknowledge you, that you are in control, to acknowledge that money is not something we should be trusting in, and to realize that maybe I should take the opportunities to do the things you've asked me to do when I have them, and to not be a hypocrite when I haven't taken the opportunities to do it and try to complain about it when I don't have the opportunities anymore. We love you. In the matchless name of Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, well, let's go ahead. We're going to sing page number 27, The Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Let's go ahead and sing it out. On the first, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, 
so despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For twas on that old cross, suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Sing it out on the last to the old rugged cross I will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear then you'll call me someday to my home far away His glory for ever I'll share so cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown well, God bless you. Thank you for being with us uh, tonight. And I just want to encourage you a couple things. Uh, be with us on Wednesday night, 7 p.m. for the Wednesday evening live stream. And then don't forget, email us. Email us for several things. If you want a prayer request, uh, want to put in a prayer request, email us. The subject line, whether it's public or private. If you'd like to come to a church service, we're not going to assume you want to come. We need you to tell us, I'd like to come and how many people and then we'll schedule you. We're a couple of weeks out, uh, but we'll try to do our best to schedule you as soon as possible, so make sure you do that. Also, if you would like to go soul winning, now you can just figure out your own soul winning plan and go. Just let us know you went and uh, how many people got saved or whatever. But if you need a partner, let us know when you can go, what day and what time of day. So I can go on Tuesday in the morning or in the afternoon or in the early evening, and we'll try to find someone that we can partner with you for that time. We'll do our best to do that. So be, make sure you're emailing us that information. And if there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. And we, of course, we love you. We miss you. And we are looking forward to the day. We can all be gathered together again. Thanks for watching.